Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Encounter Church Wednesday night service Bible study. I'm Pastor Pat. Great to have you with us. and We really do appreciate you tuning in. We have a great teaching for you tonight from Pastor Frida, our missions pastor here at Encounter Church. But before she comes and before she, she shares this great message with you, a couple of announcements. Something happening actually with Pastor Frida and the women's ministry here at Encounter Church. This coming Saturday is the hike with the Father. Father, that is with the Heavenly Father. And that's this, win this Saturday, July 24th at 10 a.m. They're gonna go to Waterton Canyon. That's in Littleton in the Roxboro area. It's stroller and kid friendly, so bring your children. It's not gonna be hard and no dogs allowed. If you have any dogs, please leave them at home. Bring a lunch, bring a notebook, and you can RSVP at ecdenver.org. That's ecdenver.org. It's gonna be a really a wonderful, fun time. So be a part of that. Now we're gonna just also say thank you for your constant, faithful, continuous support of what we do here at Encounter Church with your giving. And the information on how to always give is on the bottom of the screen. Of course, text to give, you can mail it to us, you can go to our website. But thank you, thank you for supporting, not really, not just Encounter Church, but thank you for supporting however God leads you to give to the body of Christ, to missions, to local churches, that your giving really helps things go a long way with what God is doing in the Denver area and in the world. So thank you for supporting us tonight. So before Pastor Frida comes, here's a great video about a, a super outreach that we at Encounter Church are doing, and you can be a part of it. So watch this, and then the teaching begins. God bless you. Hello, EC family. I'm Jordan Clark. And I'm Elena Pazera. We are so excited to continue our Living in Love for Lansing Elementary Community Service Impact Project. Lansing Elementary is a Title I school in Aurora who serves 95% of their students on free and reduced lunches. With this community service project, we will be purchasing and packing over 200 backpacks full of school supplies, lunch boxes, and other essential needs to get these students back to school come August. Just as it states in Acts 4, 34 and 35, this is a wonderful opportunity for us to come together as a church family and to give to those in need right here in our own local community and to share the love of Jesus. For this project, we are trying to raise $3,500 to be able to purchase the necessary school supplies and items for the students and families of Lansing. We hope to see you right here on July 24th at 10 a.m to pack and pray over these backpacks to send them off to school. Thank you everyone for your incredible faithfulness and support of this project as we continue to live in victorious love for our local communities. Thank you. <laughs> it's a season to celebrate, isn't it? At our home, we're celebrating birthdays this week it seems like we've celebrated Marilyn's birthday, we celebrated small group birthdays, lots of celebration. And when we celebrate, it's always a happy time. We celebrate anniversaries sometime. We celebrate things that happen in our country. Celebrations sometimes stir up the very emotions that took place on the day we're celebrating. It's tempting to allow our joy to depend on whether there is something good to celebrate happening in our, in our lives. Sometimes we celebrate, sometimes we force ourselves to celebrate. When our family or our community has something sad, it's hard to celebrate. I love the book of Philippians. I've read it many times, I've taught it many times, and Philippians tells us to rejoice. The other day I was reading the Passion Translation and I read in chapter four, verse four and five. I'm gonna read it to you. It really challenged me. This particular translation is very meaningful. It says, be cheerful with joyous celebration in every season of life. Let joy overflow for you are united with the anointed one. Let gentleness be seen in every relationship for our Lord is ever near. So in looking at this, most translations say rejoice 
And again, I say rejoice. But this one says, be cheerful with joyful celebration. That's a mandate. That's an action required. And actually, it's an act of choice. Because there are a lot of times you don't feel like celebrating. It says, be cheerful. The Amplified says, delight, take pleasure. Another translation says, keep on rejoicing. It's like, this is not just for now. It's a continual action. And another one says, be full of joy. So when are, to be, are we to be full of joy? It says here, in every season. And other translations say, always. So let's look at some of the seasons that we're to be joyful in. When you think about the seasons of life, there's youth, middle age, senior, old, every season, wherever you are in life, this verse encourages you to be joyful. There are seasons of health. You might have good health, be healthy and trim. You might be energetic or slower, tired, or even dramatically ill. This verse still says, rejoice always. Might be some seasons of wealth, poor, in debt, just getting by, wealthy, needs met day by day, or even homeless. And so often we think, if I just had this much money, if I just made $100 a week more, or, or if, 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 and we think somehow, that having more money is going to bring us more happiness. Then we could smile more. Then we could be more uh, joyful and portray joy more. But researchers have found almost no correlation between income levels and happiness. Between 1957 and 1990, income levels in the U.S. doubled. Yet, at the same period, people's levels of happiness did not increase. In fact, reports of depression actually increased tenfold. So, perhaps more money is not the answer to you being joyful. Then there's seasons of mood. Sometimes we're happy, and sometimes we're angry. Sometimes things are just not going our way. Sometimes we're disappointed, hurt, grieving. Am I really supposed to be joyful during all these seasons of life? That's what the word says. And then there's one more area that I think of, and that's seasons of relationships. Sometimes our relationships are great. I mean, everything's going good. You know, you're getting along with your husband, your wife, your kids. It's just a great season. But sometimes it's not so great. It's kind of mediocre. Or sometimes you feel like you have no friends. And sometimes our relationships are especially troubling. Some are very troubling. Or they might even be abusive. I hope you're not in one of those. But if you are, does that excuse us from being cheerful or joyful? Well, not according to this verse. So how much are we to rejoice? It says, let joy overflow. That means a whole lot of joy that we're supposed to show hard sometime, isn't it? So why should I rejoice? Well, number one, God just told us to. And this isn't the only verse. There's quite a few other verses in the Bible that tell us to rejoice. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 says, rejoice always, very similar to this verse. So we are to let joy be our continual feast, it says in the Passion Translation in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16. Another reason we should rejoice, is right here in this fourth verse. It says, you are united with the anointed one. I mean, being united with Jesus, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and loved by the Father, is always cause for celebration. You can't, God can't get any closer. He's dwelling right here. And to me, it really is almost a daily awe to think that God Almighty, the creator of the universe, lives in me and is actually living out his life through me, I think that's worthy of meditation. And I think I honestly can say that I meditate on this every day because it is such a marvelous truth. And it changes our life. It changes our perspective. Now, it is our rejoicing is not in our season 
or our mood or according to our season or mood or circumstance, our rejoicing is in this eternal truth that the God of joy is inside of us. The anointed one, Christ, he's not only with us, he is in us. And you know, he has abundant of joy. He's the author of joy. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy. So if he lives in us, it's there. Not just a little bit of joy to get us through the day, but abundant joy. And so leaning on him to let his joy come through is the answer to our always rejoicing. We need to let it go. It says, let joy overflow. If there is joy in there, then letting it out is a matter of our giving permission for the Holy Spirit, for his joy to come forth in our life. A uh, story is told about a conference in a Presbyterian church in Omaha. People were given helium-filled balloons and told to release them at some point in the service when they felt joy. And so all through the service, a balloon would go up, another balloon would go up, another balloon. But at the end, a third of the balloons were still in the hands of the congregants. Why? I think sometimes we know we have joy, we have joy to share it, but for some reason, we're just not letting it overflow in our life. Let your balloon go. Just let it, the joy in your life go. If you are a Christian, you are united with God. You do have joy. You possess it. Let it be expressed. Let joy overflow. Proverbs says, Laughter does good like a medicine. And I've heard doctors report that even manufactured, made up laughter changes your personality and changes the health of your body. So it's healing to laugh. It's healing to allow love joy to come out of you. The next verse, verse five says, let gentleness be seen in every relationship for our God is ever near. So what has that got to do with it? Well, this is one paragraph in chapter four of Philippians. Let gentleness be seen in every relationship. So the action required here is to let gentleness be seen. Again, it's letting it come forth. The NIV says, let gentleness be evident. Another translation says, let your reasonableness be known. Another, another one, your fair forbearing spirit. So the Amplified gets it all, of course. Let your graciousness, your unselfishness, your mercy, tolerance, and patience be known. Again, it's let. In other words, let it be released. Because these qualities as Christians, already reside in us. They are part of the Godhead. They're part of the Holy Spirit. So allowing them to come forth is what God asks us to do. And where in every relationship, whether it's a friend or foe, family, likable or not likable, enemy, neighbor, it says every relationship. And I think sometimes we reserve the gentleness, the kindness, the goodness, the joy joyous life. We reserve it for certain relationships. But right here, he says, let it be forth in all, come forth in all relationships. Now, can you do that by yourself? I don't think so. So how are we going to do this? Well, the very next words are, the Lord is ever near. And when I first read that, I thought, yeah, the Lord's watching. So you better be good, you know? And it's not that he's watching to see if you're good. It's not like he's watching to see, are you going to be gentle? Are you going to be kind? Are you going to do the right thing? It's not that. It's like he's right there. He's going to be your aid. And he's not beside us. I think sometimes we think that, God, come with me. Help me in this. Or come with me there. Help me in that. No, he's right here. Everywhere I go, he's right here. At the same time, he's already been where you're going. So he knows exactly what's going on ahead. So when he says he's going to help us, he says he will. So when he says rejoice evermore 
or rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. Remember, this is Paul talking. He's in prison. It's not fun in prison. And he's been persecuted. He's not had such a fun life. And yet he's the one that says, rejoice, rejoice, because he knows about the power within. And that's what I'm saying. If we rely on the power within us to do what he asks us to do and rejoice, or to let the gentleness, the character of God come through, we're going to have a happier life for one thing, but we will influence our family, our community, those around us with his love, with his character, with his presence. And God, the Holy Spirit, is the one that can transform our lives. So maybe you don't like your circumstances. You don't like what's happening right now. And maybe your life really isn't good right now. It is sad. You might be grieving. You might have horrible things happening. Or maybe relationships just aren't good at all. But the Holy One on the inside, the Holy Spirit, He will help you. Lean on Him. We have a joy that overcomes all this. We truly do. So there was a third century man who was anticipating death. He penned these last words to a friend. He said, it's a bad world, incredibly bad world. But I have discovered in the midst of a quiet, of, a, of it, a quiet and holy people who have learned a great secret. They have found a joy which is a thousand times better than any pleasure of our sinful life. They are despised and persecuted, but they care not. They are masters of their souls. They have overcome the world. These people are Christians, and I am one of them. You know, the world notices when the circumstances of life and community do not get us down. When those things don't steal our joy. So as you think about this verse, you think about the command that God said, rejoice evermore, rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. Are there some joy robbers in your life? Can you identify them right now? I think some of us can say, yeah, my joy robber is my bank account or my family member or a politician, or the traffic. I mean, there's a lot of things that just take away our joy. They rob us. So we don't always feel happy, but that does not mean that our joy needs to be taken away. So if you identify your joy robber right now, just put that right down there. Just just take one. All right, how can we apply the truth of being united with the Holy One be anointed with the anointed one, who is really the almighty God, how can we take that truth and apply it to our particular loss or that particular thing that we're being deprived of, the thing that's been robbed? Well, take the joy that God gives you and use it as a weapon. You know, the story is told of Masena, one of Napoleon's generals, he suddenly appeared with 18,000 men before an Austrian town which had no means of defense. The town council had nearly decided to surrender when an old dean of the church reminded them that it was Easter and begged them to hold services as usual and to leave the trouble to God. This they did, and the French, and The French, hearing the church bells ringing joyfully, concluded that an Austrian army had come to defend the place and quickly broke camp. Before the bells ceased ringing, all the Frenchmen had disappeared. That's an amazing story. But you know, many times, even in the Bible, there are stories when when the army went forth singing and the enemy fled. How many times have you just said, I am going to rejoice. I don't feel it, but I'm going to do it. And things have changed. I know in my life, many times, if I'm sad, angry, disappointed, I'll pray in the spirit or I'll sing a psalm. I may not feel like it. I may not like it, but praying in the spirit has helped me so much. Sometimes it's kind of loud and angry at the beginning. 
But by the time I'm finished, the joy of the Lord really is in my heart. I feel like some of you really need the joy of the Lord today because it is your strength. That's what the word says. The joy of the Lord is our strength. If the enemy can take away your joy or my joy, he's won half the battle. And he's not worthy of winning the battles that we have. have. And Christ already won the battles for us. And he is the victorious one within. And so let's establish the joy of the Lord today in your circumstance. And if you have lost a job, lost a loved one, lost a relationship, or you're just having a bad day, the joy of the Lord is here for you and his strength with it. Because the joy of the Lord is not separated from the Lord. It comes together. And even though you don't feel happy, you can be victorious and you can win over the things that are robbing you of joy. I'd like to pray for you. Father, thank you that we can rejoice and again rejoice in spite of the circumstances of our life. We thank you that we are united with you the author of joy, the source of our joy. We're united with you. Thank you. I pray for everyone listening today that they will hear your voice, receive your joy, and act it out. Thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi there, I'm Pastor Reese, and you've been watching one of our streaming messages here from Encounter Church. I want you to know that at Encounter Church, we are a diverse community of people who seek God together and share Jesus and love to our city and world. And that's our heart towards you. Uh, we want you to have an amazing relationship with God. We want you to understand how much God loves you. We want you to know that He has real practical solutions for the challenges you face in life, whether those are emotional challenges or physical challenges or financial challenges, uh, whatever they are, Jesus is there to help you and to, to guide you and steer you through that. But all of that potential help is just, it's just waiting there until you release it. And the way we release it is by making a decision to welcome Jesus into our hearts as both our saviors, as the, as the one who forgives us of our shortcomings and failures, our sins, if, you're, if you would allow me, but also as our Lord, as, as someone that we go to and say, you know, not my will, but yours be done. You know, Christ, I, I don't know how to, to fix this. I've made a mistake, I've done something, I've messed this situation up, but I'm looking to you to help me. When we do that, when we invite Jesus into our hearts, uh, he literally, uh, makes us become born again, is what the King James uses. It's, it's a term which reflects to us experiencing a new life that wasn't there before. And so right now, I'd just like to pray with you if you would like to experience that new life. If you'd like to invite Christ into your, to your heart as your Lord and Savior right now, just say this with me. Say, Dear Jesus, I believe in you. I need you. Forgive me of my, my failures and my sins and become my Lord, lead me into a better way of life. And I ask this in faith, amen. You know, if you did that, know that God heard that prayer and God responded. And uh, we'd like to send you some uh, information that we believe would be a help for you. If you would just email us at ec at ecdenver.org, uh, we'll, we'll get that out to you. Uh, if you don't have an email file, uh, you can uh, you call us at 303-770-0400 and you can speak to somebody in our church office and we'll be able to connect with you as well. God bless you. We love you. We will look forward to seeing you next time right here at Encounter Church.